All right, we want to grow cucumbers. Let's get going here. Welcome, guys. We're going to discuss everything that I can think of, of how you can successfully grow cucumbers from the types of cucumbers there are, as far as eating, as far as the type of growing, the actual plant uh, care, diseases, and things like that. So let's just jump right in with the very first thing. I think before you guys grow, you guys might want to think about what type of cucumber you actually like. If you don't know this, I say that you plant all of them. <laughs> the first one is English cucumber. Uh, this is got like a thin skin. They're long uh, and lanky. They have very uh, small seeds in them, and they're considered burpless. So this is a key factor I look at. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of have the same reaction sometimes, very mild with cucumbers in contrast to, say, bell peppers. Uh, I get this, like this gas, like this burp, right? This You can just kind of feel it. Some of these are a lot less, um, I would say, not invasive, but a lot less, they're more digestible, basically. And English cucumbers are one of the best ones, I think, that we can uh, consider when it comes to that. Uh, the next one on my list here is regular old garden cucumbers. These are the ones you're going to find in the grocery stores, you know, that are dark green and uh, they have like larger seeds and thicker skins and they have a very strong, potent flavor. Uh, different varieties are pickling cucumbers. And these I've actually, I'm growing for the first time this year. My mother says that this is her favorite to eat. I've never really eaten them uh, just as a fruit. I've, I've tried them as pickles, but I want to do, you know, because of the cost of food here in 2023 here, you know, I've, I've got to grow as much as I can. So I want to do a heck of a lot of pickles this year and I'm growing different varieties and see which ones I like. Um, one of the things I can say about all these cucumbers too, before I move forward is that picking them small, anything as a small, it sounds strange as a baby tastes a lot better. Um, and we're going to go over some hacks and stuff like that, but that's one of them there is, is, uh, getting them while they're small. They, they're a lot, there's a lot more flavor to them. I think that's what I'm hoping with the pickling because pickling cucumbers are very meaty. They're very crisp. Um, you know, some of them though, some different varieties that I'm growing are supposed to be a lot sweeter and also a lot less gassier. So you got to kind of play around with the types. Uh, what I like about the pickling cucumbers too is that they're small. Um, some of these different smaller varieties, if you guys notice, if it's just you or you and one kid or something or you and your spouse, and sometimes you cut that thing in half and it starts to go bad, right? And I like that's why I like the smaller servings. Um, American cucumbers are also a good variety. They're also kind of known as the snake cucumbers. American cucumbers are slender and long. Uh, they also have an, a mild flavor to them. The skin is very thin, so they actually don't need to be peeled. So that's something to take in consideration. The last one I have for you guys here is lemon cucumbers. And, you know, really, I don't know if it's just different varieties or something, but there's not quite like my favorite. Uh, they're like little, they're, they're lemon cucumbers. They're, they're like a little like softball size. And uh, they got little points on them and everything on the skin. And it seems to me if you don't get the center part of where the seeds are, the juice, you don't get that lemony, citrusy kind of flavor. But not quite my favorite out of all. Um, just because, like I said, the, the flavor, I mean, it, there was one time when I was growing them in aquaponic system and they actually came out really, really sweet and kind of tangy. So I don't know if it's a measure of when, if maybe I picked them too early or too late you know if you if you let cucumbers go too late they're going to get bitter so this is one of those that you might want to try before you grow a whole bunch all right so we wrapped up on uh, a bunch of different types to eat let's talk about the different types to grow now we do have vining ones right these are the ones that are very common i think everybody knows about i didn't know that there was actually a bush one as well it's a very compact one so these are things to take in consideration as well if you don't have a lot of space you might want to go with the bush um, varieties. And there's one I'm trying out this year called the pickle bush. Uh, it's a very common one. And what these things do is they don't really have the tentacles and stuff. They're not going to grow all over and hang on things, but they, uh, they do need some support like a tomato basket or something. And they don't absolutely need it, need it. Uh, but it kind of helps to kind of support them and keep them going. They do, they are heavy producers. Uh, these things could be grown in pots, Right. So these things will do actually a heck of a lot better in container gardening than um, the vining type. I found that the vining type really they do not produce. They do not like being in my garden systems uh, where I grow in burlap 
and um, in a hanging system, they do a heck of a lot better in the ground, in my opinion. I think everything, all plants do better on ground, but some you can get by really great with uh, as far as like the, the bush type. Um, this is stuff you don't want to prune. Uh, if you've got bad leaves and stuff like that, I guess we'll talk about that later um, th as far as removing them and when and how. But basically, you don't want to prune these guys. Just if you're growing the bush, just let them be. Same goes with the vining type. Um, what I like to do is create a trellis with some rope and I just keep winding them around the rope and let them climb up. You can hang them on trees, all kinds of different things. Um, I think another tip too, I like to say with the bush varieties is if you were able to, <clears throat> if you're growing them in a container and you set them up high and just let them kind of fall down like grapes. Uh, that is actually something that works out very well. Uh, if you're looking to grow the bush varieties, I have three types here, the bush champion, pickle bush, which I said I'm already growing, and also a salad bush. Try those out and see how that variety works for you. And let me know what you uh, what you think about them. So one of the things I've observed but I can't really prove is the vining type of cucumbers. Uh, what is it called over here? Uh, it's known as an adventitious root, right? And this is so when uh, you have tomatoes, if you lay a tomato down right in the soil, it'll actually form roots in the ground. Uh, some watermelons, I believe, do this as well, and pumpkins. So the vine comes out, it's touching the ground, it'll send roots in to anchor itself. And it's said that it doesn't really, the extra adventitious roots don't really give much to the plant. It just kind of anchors them down there, you know, so they don't get blown around or whatnot. But the main nutrients comes from the main stem. So if you do experience where your cucumber is actually starting to root from, say, little nodes, you know, little elbows in the areas, it's said, right, that it's not really going to do much for the plant. I don't see how this is possible. I, I didn't cell phone, you know, call up the, uh, get them in attendees and ask the cucumbers themselves. Uh, but I have never done a large experiment to see if it produced more than something that, say, didn't touch the ground. So something to take in consideration. Okay, so... Now that we know our varieties and everything, I think we should talk about uh, the soil. Um, now, most plants, just like cucumbers, they're going to want a pH neutral, which is depending on who you're listening to, anywhere from from uh, 6.5 to 7.2. I think some say from 6 6.0 to 7.0. I say around 6.5 to 7.2. And the pH balance means that whatever soil you have, if you're growing in your backyard, uh, there might be a, a acidic or alkaline, and that means you have to amend things. You have to get that soil balanced. You may have to throw some lime in there or something like that. So a lot of people don't realize, too, is that, especially if you live in a tract home, they scraped that land and they took all the topsoil off. So you're down to, like, bare land. You, know, you don't know what you're getting. That's why I always consider uh, telling people, if you're going to start out gardening, especially if you're a beginner, uh, go for a container gardening. Now, I, I live in some areas where... Uh, if you got anybody follows me, I farm on somebody else's property that I don't own in exchange for food and paying the water bill. Uh, but there's relatively nice soil there, right? But I like if a plant's diseased or something like that, I like to be able to move it around. And I don't want to guess, basically, is my biggest thing. I don't want to sit here and guess the if five feet away from me is going to be acidic or there's somebody dumped motor oil in the past, you know, 50 years ago or something like that. I like to just have my soil uh, that I make myself and I plant it in containers. One of the... Uh, tricks, I would say, of container gardening and in the soil is that you can use such things as my methods. If you want to check it out, it's called biodegradable container gardening. Uh, a BC gardening guy, you can check out my handle on uh, YouTube, Instagram, and all that kind of stuff. But what I what happens is I'm able to grow my plants and start them in a five gallon container with burlap. And when the burlap uh, touches the ground, it actually starts to decompose and the roots have a way to actually send their their roots through the burlap and into the ground and this kind of tells me where the plants are going to be happy uh in in different regions different parts of the land so the soil mixture of everything you guys will hear because we're going to do a lot of shows on how to grow things right and i've wanted to make this completely simple for myself you know it's kind of funny my daughter asked me, why do you work so hard, dad? And I said, because I'm lazy. And she just looked at me like a dog, you know, sideways, like what? Um, I work very hard to figure things out because I know that it's a gift to my future self. And one of the gifts to my future self, and I hope for you as well, is to just create your own soil. And I've made it very simple, three parts. That's all you have to do. 
So mine, you don't have to follow this uh, with the, the the compost, right? We'll get into that. Mine is a is get yourself like three five gallon buckets, right? Or any containers, a one gallon cup, whatever it is. It's just it's equal three parts. Fill one a container with uh, peat moss, and then dump that into a wheelbarrow or tarp or whatever you're mixing it in. Get yourself some uh, perlite if you choose. I don't really like that. I like vermiculite a little better. I'm, I'm just kind of giving you guys some options here because of supply chain shortages we have in 2023. Uh, vermiculite's my top choice. So another equal parts, five gallon. And then get I get worm castings, a complete five gallon of worm castings. I go ahead and dump that in, mix that all up. I may throw a couple things like some green sand, some feather meal. Um, what else? Uh, maybe a little bit of calcium or something in there. And just a couple little amendments, right? Mix that all up. And then what you're going to get out of those three buckets is, is about two five gallon. If you have three five gallon containers, you're going to get two nice, good packed five gallon containers out of that mixture. And that's just the perfect amount, um, to grow just about anything. So creating your own soil, we know that this is pH neutral and everything. And you don't have to sit there and fuss and worry about what's going on in your backyard. Um, that's the most simplest, simplest way. So as far as the cucumber too, uh, you know, I did mention that you need trellises. They are going to do a heck of a lot better. I wanted to, before we move forward, it's kind of like a watermelon when they're sitting on the ground, they start to turn yellow, right? Sometimes they even get rot. They're susceptible to bugs. When they're hanging, they are very, very uh, uh, delicious and then perfect in color. I just, for me, I very strongly advise people to use yourself a trellis. So now that we have our soil built, we need to ask ourselves, are cucumbers heavy feeders? What do I mean by that? You're going to find out about a lot of plants. Some plants are very hungry for both water and nutrients. Things like a tomato is very, it's, it's, it's very hungry for water and for nutrients. So cucumbers are, are no different. These guys are going to want to eat. So if you're growing a cucumber in a, in a five gallon container, you're going to want to give it some nutrients. So how do you properly give it nutrients? To me, again, is very simple. Um, you shouldn't really need a lot if you are growing, uh, making your own soil with the worm castings. Um, and I forgot to mention too, guys, that there's just so much. Uh, my apologies here. You can actually use compost in place of worm castings if you want as well. And one of the things I want to talk about with these heavy feeders is that the difference between worm castings and compost is that compost is readily available, in my opinion. Uh, you see guys are going to hear stuff all over, different opinions. This is just my opinion and my experience. They'll use up the compost really fast, the nutrients in it, and you're going to want to add amendments. Whereas with the worm castings, worm castings are like casings, like little sausages, and it lets out a little bit at a time. So your plants are always getting a little bit of something. The problem, though, is is if it's only in a five-gallon container and it starts to suck up everything that's there, it can't wait to get more nutrients. It's going to get it. It's going to get some. The worm castings will release them in time. But that's when you kind of want to do like a side dressing of either some fresh worm castings or some compost or like maybe a, to keep it simple, I use like a seven, a triple seven uh, amendment. This is plant food. You basically think of this like a vitamin. Some people are against this type of stuff, but to me, I'm like, it's the same thing as eating a multivitamin, right? So at equal parts means nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So like some people will say a 10, 10, 10. That means 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% uh, potassium. Um, I'll go with like a triple seven and you can use this as like a foliar spray. Uh, that means that you would mix like a teaspoon or a tablespoon to it for a gallon and you get yourself one of those bug sprayers and you just mist the plants, right? And then what happens is the, the leaves actually absorb the moisture um, and can take in these nutrients that way. You can also, uh, like I said, side dress with some more worm castings or, and side dress means that you just kind of dig around the top area and just kind of bury a little bit of extra food in there, right? So you can do that with compost. You can do that with worm castings. You could also just make a mixture of vitamins, like a tea. I mean, there's so much to get it. We can, we can also ferment a bunch of teas and put stuff in a bubble. We don't have time to talk about that today, but if you get into worm casting teas and, and fermentation and stuff like that, you could just, it, it's water soluble. The quickest way and easiest way, I think, if you're getting started is to buy something that's like a triple seven or triple 10 uh, liquid fertilizer, mix it in a container, and when you pour it in, the roots literally absorb it in, like instantly. So your plant's really getting food. And you want to do this about every three to four weeks right 
And so we might as well move forward now that we're talking about the heavy feeders and the soils and stuff like that. How long is this plant going to take to actually mature? Now, the general thumb is anywhere from 50 to 70 days. Um, I would say about 60 days, so about two months or so before it reaches full maturity. Um, the, the germination rate um, is going to take about sometimes three to seven days. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But yeah, your, uh, your plants are going to mature and you want to give them that feeding maybe twice in their lifetime, maybe three. Keep an eye on them, I say. You know, that's just, just general information. It, to me, it doesn't fit because if you live in a place like Florida or in, basically a place where it rains a lot, you know, and you got your stuff outdoors, it's washing nutrients away. So you kind of have to keep an eye on your plants. You'll see them vibrant green to make it totally simple. That once they start to turn a little yellow or light lime green, whatever, you can kind of tell that they're kind of hungry. They're telling you something, right? So go over there, give them a feeding whenever you think that you need to. Just be careful not to overfeed. You give too much nitrogen, then you're not going to get blossoms. You're going to get this huge amount of growth, right? So you need to understand the difference. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so now that we have our cucumbers all set up and we have them feeding and all that kind of stuff, we actually need to kind of worry about what are pests and diseases. Now, the only one I have experienced so far is aphids. And they are the devil. They are evil incarnate. Um, no, they're not personally evil, but they, they multiply. These are nasty little creatures and they will start to really mess with your plant. The ants will actually come in and defend them. You see, the aphids will suck on the leaves to, to get any sugars out of the plants that they're photosynthesizing. And they'll actually get this little tiny, how could we say, like a pea, pea little gel. It's just this little tiny pot. It's, well, it's sugary. It's sweet. This is the sugar passing through the aphid. And the ants love that, so they will take care of the aphids. They'll actually farm them like, like little, like cattle. They'll protect them. They'll actually move them and place them in different spots. And they work in a symbios symbiosis here. It's so very interesting. So, I can tell you with aphids, one of the things that you'll want to do is you're going to want to spray um, um, with water if you do get a mild infestation on there. The best line of defense you could do is plant something like a brassica. Uh, one of the things, what, what is a brassica? Uh, this is the cabbage family. So aphids, what I find, will go after cabbages a lot quicker than that. This is their preferred food. So what I'm saying here is a decoy. So you're going to plant, say, some Russian kale, or in my case, I did daikon radish. And what I did is put daikon radish in the ground. This is just going to rot. And this is, you know, I'm not even going to eat most of this stuff. It's just going to rot and create compost naturally. That's a whole building soil thing that I want to talk about in another podcast. Um, but the aphids, if you plant these around, especially in container gardening, again, you can start adding stuff all around that different that different plant that you have in contrast to growing something say in a raised bed or where it's crowding up basically so a lot of these shallower shallower roots can be grown in pots and you can kind of place them around as a defense mechanism as a decoy as i said um slugs and snails um is another big problem that you can have they this year in 2023 i live in san diego north county it's just preposterous it's insane they're everywhere i have a, a jacuzzi in the house i'm renting here and they're climbing in the jacuzzi they're in our tennis shoes they're climbing up the walls they're on the windows slugs and snails everywhere right so the only line of defense you're going to have with these guys is going to be like something like slug o plus which is supposed to be something natural right full of iron i think it was i don't know if i trust it but these guys are very difficult very difficult i even in my way of gardening, the biodegradable container gardening way, I have a lot of stuff that's suspended off the ground, right? And I use such things as different types of paints and uh, like axle grease and stuff like that to, and any penetration, any place where the, the where a stand, a post touches the ground, it is sealed with these kind of sealants so that when the, ant, the ants and the slugs go to climb up, they don't like the chemicals and they'll literally stay away. It's like a blockage, right? Like a, a dam, basically a gate where they won't cross. That's my first line of defense for them. But get this, guys. It wasn't last week. I, you always learn something new in gardening. I got hit in the shoulder with a slug. And I'm in my greenhouse. And my greenhouse, I said, everything's suspended. It's not touching the ground. 
I shouldn't have to worry about slugs. They're climbing up the plastic onto the ceiling and then falling down onto my plants. So these guys will start causing leaf damage. They'll start eating your fruits. Uh, very nasty little creatures. Uh, something you're going to have to contend with. Now, I have experienced spider mites. And it was very interesting. They were actually on a tomato. Spider mites, they look like these little tiny orange crabs. Reddish color. And they cover up the plant with this web. And like literally just like cocoon. They start to cocoon your stuff up. Interesting that I waited about three days. My tomatoes actually died because of it though. But this little black beetle showed up. It's like the size of a pinhead. It just came up and they mopped them. I mean, I literally, I was watching them just mop, eat one after another, after another, after another. Just mopped them out and completely destroyed them. And I never had mites ever again. Um, one of the things I'm going to, I'll say to you with pest control, uh, one of the things I found was the parasitic wasp. So in my garden, especially on my cucumbers and stuff like that, when I start to see the, the, um, uh, aphids showing up, I had to wait again in a whole nother year for these parasitic wasps to show up. And what they'll do is they'll go over there and they will start to uh, colonate, right? Because there's a whole bunch of, uh, of, of aphids which they prey on. Their numbers have 10x this year. They're all over the place. And what do they do? They sting and inject a, a larva inside of the aphid. And they call them zombie aphids. It's very interesting if you get a, a, uh, a magnifying glass and look at them. You'll just see this big balloon. And you can tell. You'll see these aphids, you know, green or purple or whatever color they are in your region and you're going to see this one just pop like a balloon at my place they're like gold color gold to lightly tan and that is a zombie a a parasitic baby wasp is going to pop out of that body eat eat whatever's in there while it's living and then go create more so very interesting natural pest controls but this is something that if someone's going in their backyard you know and you don't have the the space and the time uh, you probably most likely are going to have to use something like neem oil or something like that. And the problems I have with a lot of these sprays is they do kill the bees. If they don't kill the bees, they hurt the bees and other insects as well. So I prefer to use nothing. One of the things you can do for slugs, spider mites, aphids, I don't know about the, my last one, cucumber beetles, I've never dealt with them, is to get yourself one of those. Don't go and buy that special expensive one they have online where it says pipe. It shoots out like this mist on the end. Just go get yourself one of those ones at Home Depot, a watering wand that has a mister on the end. And that definitely has the control of pressure on the handle. Very important. So what you're going to do is you're going to stick that head that in a swivel as well. I'd like to recommend, you know, that the head swivels back and forth. And so you can put it straight up or uh, at an angle. You're going to stick that head inside your plant and lightly mist like a, 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 a mist until the plant, the leaves aren't getting bruised, right? And what this will do is you can just wash off a lot of the uh, bugs that are in there. <clears throat> and one of the things you could do if you need to, spray some dish soap or some neem. Do this early in the morning before the bees come. Let it sit for about 10 minutes. And then go in there with the mister and wash it off before everybody shows up for lunch, right, to get their pollen. One of the things I did is I added a soap. I used uh, Blue Dawn dish soap. And uh, a couple variations, whatever you're going to try. Go and pick a leaf that's got an infestation of these aphids and get yourself a magnifying glass. And what you can do is you're going to spray it and you're going to count a timer. Set it for like five minutes. And then get that magnifying glass and you'll literally see, are they dead? Sometimes, so if they're not, wait about another five minutes to ten minutes to see, are they dead? The aphid's not crawling around now, right? If they're not, you need to up your mixture a little, maybe one more quarter teaspoon of soap. Do this until you know the ratios. And what you can do is... I said spray everything at regimented time and then wash it off immediately. The only problem I have with that is that it goes into the soil. And if you're, you got worms and other bugs, they're getting soap, neem oil and things like that. And I don't think worms are going to be too happy with neem oil, uh, a neem oil shower. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> powdery mildew. This could be a problem. I'm going to give you guys, uh, it looks like it's been working for the past couple of years. It's called horsetail. And you could actually take this injustice for yourself for a kidney flush. Don't take my word for it, though. I'm not a doctor, right, or a nutritionist. But it's, to it's totally safe. Um, I have frogs and lizards and stuff in my garden, too. So that's kind of where I like to not use, you know, chemicals and stuff. So horsetail tea is basically horsetail plant. It looks like bamboo. It's dark green. You chop it all up. You boil it for about 10 minutes. And then you add about a cup of this mixture to a gallon of water. 
and you spray your plants and you don't wait until there's powdery mildew. You just start spraying that stuff once a week. I'll go in. That's, that's kind of like in my garden, especially when it comes to my cucumbers and zucchini and stuff. I go in and I'll just do a walkthrough and get this regimented chore list. And I have found that it actually keeps powdery mildew away. Now, what is powdery mildew? You'll start to see like, it looks like baby powder. Um, it's like the Michelin tire man. If you guys remember before these little spores, it's like a donut on top of a donut and they just start growing, growing, growing and they poof, they blow up and they send spores all over the place and they'll stick to other things. So some places are more prone than others. I'll give you guys another tip. A friend of mine who I was gardening with, she had this one corner where she would grow pumpkins and stuff like that. And it always got powdery mildew, no matter what she did. She scraped it. She redid stuff. It's just the spores were there just in that specific corner. So again, you got to kind of figure out where and what you guys are going to, um, how you guys going to grow this stuff. I want to make sure to remember to, <coughs> um, to tell you guys a hack uh, that you can do, uh, for this problem, for this situation, for diseases and pests. Uh, but before we go, it's downy. One of them is downy mildew. This is also a fungal disease, but it causes yellow spots in like, in the leaves the growth on the undersides. I've never experienced it. There's bacterial wilt and anthracnose, I think what it's called, the fungal disease that causes dark sunken spots on the leaves, stems, and fruit. So I I look so I live in San Diego. I don't deal with these. I'm sure there's a heck of a lot more of these type of diseases and things. But really when it comes down to it, to wrap this these diseases and and, and pests and stuff up is um, you guys have hopefully watched the show about land racing with, uh, um, uh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> I kept wanting to say Andrew Saul, but that's a different guy. Joseph Lofthouse. There we go. Thank you, my brain. Uh, check that out. Land racing. Basically, what you guys have is weak species of plants. So especially if you're growing in a backyard, you don't really have much of an option. But one of the things that you can do, I can tell you, is a lot of diseases and pests are migratory. Uh, notice that the tomato hornworm only comes in at a certain point, right? Uh, aphids, when it gets too cold, they will stop. Um, so one of the backup plans is just that. It's a backup. Get if you're, if you're germinating your own seeds, always succession plant. You guys can do this in like little tiny cups, little tiny paper cups if you choose, whatever kind of vessel the seed's starting. And just keep yourself like like a six pack or four or even just like two or three plants on hand every time. So you plant your, your, uh, cucumber, right? Well, two weeks in, why don't we go ahead and plant some more seeds? And then two weeks after that, let's go ahead and plant some more seeds. Something happens to that plant. You have some, a backup to immediately replace it so that you can keep gardening. So that's, that's one of my tips there for you guys, especially when you're dealing with all these diseases, you never know. And a lot of these diseases I'd like to say too, and pests and stuff too, you could be experiencing, but your neighbor won't. So you, I'm, there's different microclimates and stuff, right? Microclimate meaning that if you had a wood fence on your south facing wall and your neighbor has a, a brick fence, that brick fence is holding solar heat. It's irradiating heat all day. So his backyard is actually going to be hotter than the natural insulative purposes of the wood fence that you have in your backyard. And this changes everything, the environment for which the diseases will live, the pest, the way your plant's gonna grow. So many things to take into factor. That's why I say we can't just generalize everything here. So, you know, one of the things I would like to say too is about is water before we move forward. I think you guys should very carefully consider that once the water pattern gets disrupted, uh, if it doesn't have like an equilibrium here, it gets too soggy, right? Uh, your plant kind of gets screwed. It's in the summer. If your plants dry out once, the, especially in a container, they're going to most likely die or get sick. And, you know, it's, it just messes with their immune system. So one of the things I do recommend is that you either get one of those water hoses that has a, a timer that goes on the spigot that you just turn. And then you, you're going to have to keep playing this. Nobody could give you a generalized idea. You know, if you live in a hot area, mild area, but basically it's a little clock thing that you can just turn, uh, say to 10 minutes, five minutes, one minute, and it has a spring in it. So it'll let water out. And as soon as the spring hits, it shuts off. And what we're going to do is we're going to run actually drip irrigation lines. And I know you're probably looking at, Oh God, this is going to get hard. It is not hard at all. Definitely. I don't have time to go into irrigation. I think I've done some shows on irrigation in the past, but it's basically a little hose that you can buy with this little snapping machine. It's a little like a handle that just basically puts a dimple 
Uh, you can use a uh, a nail if you wanted to. Just put a little hole, and then you just snap this little piece in there with this little tiny hose that goes out, and wrap it around inside your pot or around your plant, and then regimentally uh, do this, uh, water this every day at the same time. Now, watering is kind of an important thing. Like there's there's people say different things, and they've had success. I like to give my water all at once. So if, on my timer, I'll do like five minutes on my whole entire garden system. And this is early in the morning before the sun comes up. I kind of don't like to flood it at night because it seems like it stays soggier, right? The soil all night. And this is a feeling thing. This is what what's awesome about growing your own food is you'll kind of be in connection with it. And maybe you'll feel different. Maybe you'll feel like doing it at nighttime. I don't know. But the best thing I think to do is keep that regimented water. Because if your plant doesn't get enough, it's going to dehydrate for one. And it's going to mess with its immune system and it's not going to do too well. But but getting you could even move forward to having that hand timer. Do what I do where I have a little battery timer. And it's got like six, I think, different adjustments. You can set the time uh, with the clock. You can set what time the water goes off for, for how long, for how many days and things like that. So th this is, I like to automate everything, especially if you guys are busy, you know, you, you own a business, you're working like me, you got a family. These are things that will help you out tremendously. So one of the things, uh, questions I've gotten was, should I just clone my, uh, my cucumbers? Meaning that you can literally just cut like a branch or a sucker off, like a tomato, if anybody's familiar with that, stick it in some water or some, some root hormone or aspirin in waters and many different honey. And basically what it means is not like cloning with DNA. You basically just cut a leaf with, with a node on it, meaning the little tiny, um, uh, like elbow, stick that in some water, it'll actually start to root and then you can transplant it. Now with tomatoes, I would say, yes, this is awesome. With basil, I would say, yes, this is awesome. I literally just cut them, stick the sucker inside of a glass jar and bam, roots show up. I take it out and I simply plant it. No chemicals, no nothing. That's the definition of cloning. Should you clone or not? Um, given that the fact that these, that cucumbers grow very quickly, um, with a temperature range of around 60 degrees, it's going to be a little slower. They are heat loving plants. So around 70 to 90 degrees or 80 degrees, you're going to get a, a lot better germination. I think closer to 90 is that that's when you're going to get damage to the seeds. The soil is just too, too hot. Uh, I think like the optimum is like around 70 degrees, but you know, it's very rare that your soil, if you're direct sowing in the ground, meaning just planting in the earth in the ground is going to get very warm. Right. And if you're growing in pots, it's going to fluctuate. You know, it's very rare we get to the soil gets to 60 to 70, again, depending on where you live. So I like to wait until the time to sow my seeds until the, the outside temperature is at least in the fifties and it's going to maintain there. And I have had no problem with my seeds popping, um, at that, that degree. I actually have a meat thermometer. The most kind of when you do, when you smoke food, right? Meats and you stick this little needle in there. I actually do that to the soil to kind of test it out to see where it's at. And, uh, believe it or not, a lot of people don't know that even if the air temperature goes down, the earth usually stays at a, a optimal range depending on what type of year, like around 55, you know, 60 degrees sometimes, depending on where you're at. So you can kind of cheat test that with a meat thermometer. But that's basically what I do is wait till temperatures are around, you know, the mid fifties or so is my ideal. Uh, for growing so yeah to conclude with this i don't think that cloning is actually that necessary it's a lot of work you know that's actually not a lot of work it's just that the seeds will pop and you'll if you're succession planting just throw some seeds in 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 a seedling pot and it's it's a heck of a lot easier i think and more natural oh so Speaking of temperature, some of you people in, I know we have listeners from all over the world too, is, uh, you know, you got to think about where you live. I used to live in Oregon, Oregon coast here in the United States. And, um, <clears throat> it was very, uh, very cold. There was years where it was like 30 days of summer and that was it. Then it went back down to cold. I was like, no. Uh, so if you live in a place like that, you know, you might want to consider doing it the prosthetic way is the way I like to joke about it is using a heating pad and get your stuff started early. That's the tricky part though, is if you put your plants out, which I've, I know people this year have done that with like tomatoes and cucumbers here in uh, San Diego. They did them in like February. Well, a free snap came back in March and killed everything, right? And that start all over again. So if you're going to grow cucumbers and stuff like that in the cold climate, this is where it gets very tricky. You're going to have to time it right. So remember what I said, you need to plant a lot of different 
uh, a succession plant. Plant a whole bunch of them every few weeks so you always, in case something happens, you can just replace it. But try different species of cucumbers. Just because one doesn't work in your area doesn't mean that all cucumbers won't. You got to try a whole bunch of different types and find out what's good. And once you find out what's great, just stick with that one. Even at the heat, even not the cold, even some places are very hot and different types of pests. Plant as many varieties as you can. And trust me, once you figure this out, think about this. You'll have a variety that you know will do well. Think about the money that you're saving and the health and the flavor of that food. Is it worth all the trouble? In my book, heck yeah, right? So I've riddled this show with most of my hacks here and there, and I kind of spent them all. I'm at the end of my show notes here, and I'm like, oh my God, I'll, um, you know, we're talking about companion planting, using trellises to use a trellis or not, starting seeds indoors, consistent watering, um, use of milk to combat powdery mildew. I kind of don't think this one works very well. Uh, I don't know. Let me know if it works for you. This is basically where you just mix like a 50 50 of like milk and water and spray it all over the mildew. I prefer the horsetail before anything even starts. Uh, neem oil works actually pretty good, but you don't want to leave it on your plants. It gets all sticky. The only thing I can say is the hand pollination. If you're noticing that your plants are growing a lot of uh, flowers and stuff, but not getting any fruits, it means they're not getting pollinated. And that's where we, we're talking about the companion planting. <coughs> if you can, do something that attracts the bees, you know, or other bugs that will come to your area, natural pollinators. But sometimes it just doesn't happen. And one of the things you can do, it's, <laughs> I don't even know if I should say it on this show. Um, Okay, uh, what, you use an electric device, right? If you've got kids in the house, use an electric toothbrush. And uh, what you can do is you can vibrate the plant and you'll see like the uh, the pollen of the male and female flowers, right? That's, a lot of people don't know. These are actually hermaphrodites, these these plants. There's a male and a female. And if you got yourself a light and, sh and hit that with electric toothbrush, you'd see like, poof, this little thing of powder come up. Well, usually that's going to fall down and then hit and basically inseminate the female flower. And that's when you start getting your fruits. Now, there are other devices that um, are used for for adults, right? Let's just put it that way. Joseph Lofthouse did a funny video on this one, and uh, he said he doesn't feel embarrassed about it one bit. And you probably understand what I'm talking about, right? But you want to get yourself the right type. And so where this is going, I know you're, you're probably thinking I'm crazy, but Joseph's the one who turned me on to where I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense. So as this device vibrates, just like the electric toothbrush, the pollen actually sticks on the tip of the plastic because it's like static, right? So you can take this and you can touch the tip of a male flower and then touch the tip of a female flower. Now you can pollinate like super, super fast because we have people saying like get a paintbrush, dust it, you know, you can cause damage and all this kind of different things. But literally the flower, it's conical, right? The, the tip could go in there. You can grab the, the, the pollen, it sticks to the end, and you just basically just touch. It just needs a little tiny bit of insemination, and wham, there you go. Um, the last thing I can say after that weird one for you, if you're not gone now, is harvesting regularly. So, uh, as I said, the, anything, usually a young baby, like microgreens and stuff like that, tastes a heck of a lot better than a full-sized uh, plant, or vegetable, I'm sorry, or fruit. So, the more you harvest the more that plant's going to want to produce fruit because, or, you know, vegetables, whichever we're going to call it here. But the more you pick and say, well, I need my survival, I'm going to produce more, right? So it's kind of an evil trick that you do with your plant. I kind of like to just mentally tell the plant, like, look, I need to eat from you, but I'm going to save your seeds and actually make sure and tend to your these babies that make sure that they're going to grow. So it's a symbiotic relationship between me and you. I know it may sound weird, but... I just kind of like to give a soft like prayer, if you will, or a thank you to the plant and let it know, be in communication with it that, hey, we're going to take this and we will continue basically your growth, but I need fruit from you. So we start to, to pick and pick and pick until the plant starts to get to its its final stage, about you know seven, uh, 70 days, um, depending again where you're at. And then we'll save those, definitely those seeds of our favorites and we'll ferment them. And to get the gel off the end, I guess is, a, is the one I didn't even have on my notes here. You, what you want to do is, uh, is first of all, to close up, the more you pick, the more they'll, they'll produce. A lot of plants are this way as well. Not all, but cucumbers are one of them. One of the things you can do is you can save that last cucumber or a couple cucumbers at the end of the growing season, scrape them all out, place them in a, in a jar of water and let them basically ferment. There's this little coating around the seed that will, a growth inhibitor 
once it ferments, it kind of rots off. You want to rinse those seeds out and then let them dry on a paper towel, put them in a paper bag, place them in a dark, cool place, not too cold, not too, well, definitely not too hot, and save those seeds to plant for next year. So guys, uh, I hope I've planted the seed of inspiration in you to get going and gardening and producing your own food, especially those, those combis and trying different varieties. And I hope this really helps you out. It's going to change your life once you start growing stuff. And it's really not that hard. The thing is, most things want to live. I want to say one last thing uh, about me cultivating my cucumbers. Literally, I will throw a whole bunch in a big giant pot. And as they start to grow, I'll just grab a shovel and just pull them out. Sometimes a little bit of roots will, will, will snap and I'll place them in a, a cups. Most of them will live. Some of them won't. But the thing that everything wants to do is live, right? So it's going to fight for it's 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 right to live and to spread its goodness and in a peaceful way with yourself to give respect to your plants your plants will respect you it's there's this energy about the whole thing this life cycle it's not as difficult it's to me it's very special to have this relationship with your food it's not as difficult as what they're making i think they're trying to make things complicated so they can sell you a bunch of crap so i hope that i've given the seed of inspiration for you to just go out there and just keep trying it and failure is your best friend, guys. Remember, I always say that. It's just because one species died doesn't mean that you have to shut operations down. Go ahead and start with different types. And when you find that one, you'll have this species for the rest of your lifetime in that area that you're at that you know will be 100% successful. So with that, thank you so much for watching. You guys like this type of thing. Go and subscribe, like, comment. Help me get this show off the ground here. It really helps to, to get things going for the algorithms. And I really want to do live events with you guys. So please subscribe and do all that stuff on the different platforms you're hearing this. So I can go live and ask questions and show you guys exactly what I'm doing. So thanks so much. I'll see you guys on the next one.